Good to see you all this morning. If I haven't met you, my name is Sean. I'm one of the pastors on staff. Blessed to be with you this morning as we continue our worship through the hearing of God's word. We all have weaknesses. Can I get a witness? But there's one weakness I think we all share. Pause for dramatic effect. (laughs) Sleep deprivation. You can be the strongest man or woman on the planet, but if you don't sleep, you are practically useless. And this is true, especially for parents. I want to show you some memes here, and I want to see if you get what I'm talking about. This first picture here, we have perception versus reality. Perception is that you're going to lay with your newborn baby and cuddle on a cloud, and everything will be amazing. Reality is, is they're going to grow up and turn sideways, and they're going to kick you in the face in your bed. I showed my wife this, and she was like, that's literally, that picture could have been taken from our house, the bottom one. (laughs) The next one here, we have parents sitting in their bed, sleeping in their bed, and the clocks are about to go back for the time change. And the child is on top, smacking mom in the face, and the meme reads this, it's clocks are going back, but you as parents, guess what you get? Nothing. You get absolutely nothing. The time change wasn't so bad as a single man, as a married man with children, the time change, we got to fix it. Because kids, they, they don't run with it. It just doesn't happen. In this last picture here, I'd like to think this is me on, on a Saturday. There's a boy on his dad's legs. The dad is sleeping. And he said, oh, look, dad, sleeping. Let's go ask him questions. Someone asked me a few weeks ago how I was doing. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm tired and They were sympathizing, you know, it's hard, probably not getting a lot of sleep. And I was like, actually, I'm sleeping. But that night, I had a 1.30, a 2.30, and a 4 a.m. wake-up call. Now, don't get me wrong. I love my kids. I'm glad to do it. There may be an element where I will miss that someday. But the following day or two, it feels like somebody took two fists and kind of went pop right in my eyes. And I get these, like, bags under my eyes and the swelling. Anybody had that? I've never had that. It's very new. And then you're kind of driving and just kind of squinting your eyes like, wow, they're really tired. But you give me sleep, give me more sleep, give me additional sleep, and I am a much better guy for it as well as everybody else around me. (laughs) Similar to the Christian life, there is something that we are in increasing need of. Sleep's helpful, but there's something even more important than sleep that God inspired Peter to write to the church to let them know. What is that? It is the moral qualities of Christ. It is the virtues of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Today we are beginning the sermon letter of 2 Peter, and we're going to learn the following message this morning in the first 11 verses. We are going to learn this, that supplying your faith with the qualities of Christ, it will do two very important things for you. It will make you productive, and it will also protect you. Supplying your faith with the moral qualities, the virtues of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, it will make you protected and it will make you productive. If these things are not a part of your life, if you don't see them and seeing them in increasing measure, your life may begin to spell danger. If you have your Bibles, turn with me, please, to 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. As you're turning there, it'll be very helpful to have a big picture of this sermon letter and what's going on. Simply, this is what's happening. False teachers are arising, not from without, but from within the Christian community. False teachers. We have a very hard time defining them, but we can describe them. And here are the things that we know from this letter. They rejected the second coming of Christ. Therefore, they did not believe in a day of judgment. Therefore, they lived a licentious lifestyle. When you hear licentious, think of a license to freely do whatever it is that you want. Do we need to be aware of false teachers today, outside and even within the church? Unfortunately, yes. I woke up, I think it was two weeks ago, maybe this last week, and I found an article on manifesting. It's not new, but it's kind of new in the sense that it's sweeping social media and you're having younger faces and voices run with it. So this manifesting idea believes that if you think something, you can make it a reality. 
You change your mind. You can change your reality. You can actually manifest it into existence. So there's one gentleman, and I don't do this to make fun of him, but just to show you what he did. He did a little song and dance. He said, money, 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 it comes to me. Money, 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 it flows to me. Hey, money, money, it comes to me. Money, 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 it flows to me. Is doing that going to make money magically appear in your bank? No. Not at all. I saw another woman, and she was teaching that you could manifest someone to text you. So I watched it. How does this actually work? And she told us. She gave a how-to. You've got to close your eyes. And she says, imagine yourself as a ghost that goes into the person's house. Not creepy at all. You find them sleeping, and then you whisper in their ear for them to text you, but don't leave yet. You have to give them a kiss on the forehead. And then you leave, and then they will text you. Will that really happen? Absolutely not. No. This is a very horrible teaching. It is absence of the grace of Jesus Christ and the glory of God. And from what I can tell, the little that I looked at it, it's very greedy for money. It is all about you and yourself. And that is not the message of the Christian life whatsoever. So God inspires Peter to write this sermon letter. Why do I say sermon letter? Because it's not quite just a sermon. It's not quite just a letter. You put them together. So if you were to take today's message and write it on paper and give it to somebody, it's kind of like that. He's forming these two together and he's preaching, exhorting them to the truth that they need to know this morning in the gospel so they can keep living according to it. So we begin in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. He says, Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter begins with credentials. But I'll give you a little side note. He actually calls himself Simeon here, not Simon. I thought his name was Simon. I'm confused. Simon is the Greek form of his name. Simeon is going to be the more Semitic or Aramaic form of it. The fact he calls himself Simeon and not Simon is a very good indicator that he really did write this letter. A lot of people will refute and say, oh, he didn't really write this. A lot of stuff you don't have to worry about necessarily. But we believe this to truly be God's word here and that Simon Peter or Simeon Peter wrote it. So he begins with his credentials here. Why does he begin with his credentials? To open the ears of the people he's writing to. There's a good possibility they've never met him before. Early on with our early presidents, before video and the photograph, most people probably wouldn't have known a lot of our early presidents or having seen them in public. You'd have passed right by them. So just like the apostles, they wouldn't have known them by face. Now, what two credentials does he give them? He's a servant and he's an apostle. What does it mean that he's a servant? It means he's a slave. There's no way around getting to this heaviness of the word. He's a slave. And as a slave, what is he saying? I have subjected myself to the will of Jesus Christ. My goal in life is to live according to his will and his glory. That's what I am. That's what I'll do. So he starts off very humble. Peter is very humble here and very faithful in what he is saying. I'm all about Jesus. And there's also a possibility that it could imply here a sense of honor to be called a servant of Yahweh, a servant of God in the Old Testament. That later on became to be something very honorable. David, servant of the Lord. Abraham, a servant of the Lord. Moses, Samuel, servants of the Lord. Now he's not just a servant. He's also what? An apostle. An apostle is someone that has been given authority to take a message somewhere else. So as an apostle, Jesus took Peter, gave him his words of truth, commissioned him to go out and take those words of truth to his church. Why is he giving us these credentials? So that the church then and the church today would do what? We would listen. L-I-S-T-E-N, listen. He wants us to listen. And so we hear the humble yet authoritative servant of Jesus Christ bring the words to the church, both then and today. He has a few things here in this first verse. He says, to those who have received a faith on equal standing as ours. It's very important to know that us as the church, we have the same faith as the apostles, the same privileges and the same blessings. They have a different position in how they serve the church, but overall we stand in the same righteous robes of Jesus before God the Father. Amen? 
And this faith is something we have received. Faith is not something you conjure up. I'm going to make myself believe. I'm going to force myself. In. No, God is gracious to give you the ability to believe in him. Salvation is 100% God and his grace and his work in our life. And he says that this reception of faith came by the righteousness of God. That is the saving righteousness of our God and Savior. Do you notice what he calls him? He refers to both the divinity of Jesus and the savior, saviorness of Jesus. Verse two, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Peter now has a quick prayer before he moves on. And what does he desire? He desires something to be more abundant in their life. What is that? Grace and peace, the gifts, the wonderfulness that God is and peace, the shalom, that wholeness that God gives to his people in Jesus. He wants it to be multiplied. Where does the multiplication happen? In the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ, our Lord. There is no growth in the Christian life apart from knowledge of God and of his son, Jesus Christ. Now, the head is not detached from the heart. The heart is not divorced from the head. They work together. But something that is important and is emphasized here is the knowledge of God. And at the very end of the book, we call these bookends. You know, when you have a shelf and you have nothing to hold your books there, so you get bookends to hold it together. He begins with knowledge in God and he ends with grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Knowledge, growth in the knowledge of God is a huge theme and a part of this letter. And I think fitting now that we finish the gospel of John, We know the good news. We believe in the resurrected Jesus. Now we want to grow in the grace that God has already given us. And that's what he's having us to do. So Peter gives credentials. He gives a prayer. And now he charges into the message. Let's charge together verse three. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Longer sentences are harder to understand. Amen? Amen. Especially when you throw a lot of commas. Verses three and four is one of those sentences. So what we're going to do is break it down into its essential parts. So we can grab a hold of this and get the message. Three things here. Number one, we find out what we have. Number two, how we got it. Number three, the result. What we have, how you got what you have, and now here's the result because of what you have. You with me so far? Number one, what do we have? Everything for life and godliness. You as a follower of Jesus have everything for life and godliness. What does that mean? You have everything for salvation life. Everything for eternal life has been given to you because of the grace of the Lord. And not only that, you have everything for godliness. That is now the life we live as a Christian in following our Lord and reflecting who he is. That's what you have. How did you get it? Two things here. One, his divine power. Power has to do with ability. Whose ability was it that saved you? gave you faith, enables you now to walk with Jesus Christ. It is 100% God's grace and ability that makes this a reality in your life. The lamp would be very foolish to boast. Look how bright I shine. Look how wonderful I am when we can walk right over there and unplug it and it's got nothing. It's like us. It becomes because we are plugged into Jesus Christ, the source, that we have anything that we are able to do his divine power, and then his calling. The Lord has called us. This is a part of why we have everything for life and for godliness. Notice how God is central, essential. He's the source of all that we talk about here. This has to be known or else when you try to go to the next part, you'll flounder. We have to start here and get this down. Calling has been understood in two different ways. Open calling and effective calling. An open call would be the last text message invite you got. 
hey, we're having a party Sunday at three o'clock. Right, check the box yes or no if you're coming. It's an open call. Effective call would be something where you are awakened and you are moved and enabled to do something you couldn't do before. Thomas Schreiner, he leans toward, or he believes it's an effective call here. He gives a handful of verses, but one he gives is really helpful. Romans 4, 17. God calls into existence that which does not exist. If it didn't exist, it doesn't have the power to openly respond or not, right? He effectively called it to be what it actually is. So, so what's the calling here? Is it an open calling? Is it an effective calling? I lean towards it being an effective call. We learned in John chapter 10 that God has given his people to Jesus. And Jesus as a shepherd, he will call them. He will lead them out. They will follow him and he will save his people. He will grab a hold of them and they will follow him. Sean, could you be wrong here? Yes. Will I solve the hundred years of debate? No, but that's just where I land and I understand both sides. And since it's here in the text, we are talking about it. The Lord has called us, but look where he's called us to, his own glory and excellence. Glory, you remember all your Christmas messages, right? In the month of December? Good. We talked about majesty. Majesty has to do with something that is weighty and leaves an impression on you, a mark. When God has invited us to his glory, he's invited us to that which is impressive, more impressive than we can possibly hold, lift, or grab a hold of on our own. Not only that, his excellence. Excellence has to do with the moral superlatives of Christ, the amazing character that is God himself. We are called to these things. It's important to remember that we are saved, not just to be saved for saved sakes. We're saved to be God's people and for him to be our God and to walk with us. Amen? Amen. What do we have? Everything for life and godliness. How did you get it? The power and the calling of the Lord. What's the result? You are now partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature. He gives a little qualification here. Having escaped the corrupted world, we are now partakers in the divine nature. Notice the escape from the corrupted world. What's the problem in it? The sin and the selfishness of people. The scripture is very clear. The problem with the world, it's not our societal structures per se. It's the heart of man and women. It's the heart of people. That's where the problem really occurs. You can fix all of the structures and documents of the world that doesn't fix the heart of people. People need an internal fixing. I was doing premarital last week and we start, we're going through a book as well called What Did You Expect by Paul Tripp? And in the book, he gives this idea, this question, what is the biggest problem in your marriage? Great question to start with in premarital. What is the biggest problem in your marriage that you haven't even had yet? What's the biggest problem? And he gives the answer, it's the sin inside of you. And it reminds us what Jesus said. You need to remove the plank that is in your eye to help remove the speck in someone else's. Often we get to the point where we have the speck and they have the plank. And we need, you know what I mean? So it's a good reminder for us to go, yeah, I have struggles. I have issues and Lord, help me. Help me. And then if I need to help my spouse or whoever it is, Lord, help me to do that. We have escaped. You were in jail. Your hands were cuffed. It was dark. Jesus Christ came in. He opened the jail cell. He took your cuffs off. He pled with the judge with his blood for you. And he took you out. And where did he take you? To partake in his now divine nature. What does that mean? Does that mean you get to become gods? The answer is no. No. You are not becoming a God in the sense of God's deity or divine nature that is solely his. You are taking on now the moral qualities of Jesus Christ. Sean, how do you know that? Because the next three verses tell us these are the attributes. These are the qualities that we are to be growing in. Don't let a Mormon ever tell you you can become a God and point you to this verse because it's not true. It looks like it at surface level, but it's not true. And context teaches us otherwise. Now we've laid the groundwork. You have everything for eternal life and godliness because of God's power and his calling. The result, you can partake now in the divine nature and you can actually look more like Jesus. You can actually be more like Christ. 
And what does that look like? Verse five. For this very reason, because of everything we just said, make every effort to supplement your faith with the following seven things. What is the source of these seven things? Faith. Where do these things come out of? Your faith. This is not a self-help program. This is not a, any kind of step. This is you are walking with Christ. You abide, you believe, and he enables you to do these things to become more like him. Amen? Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. What is virtue? Virtue is excellent character that is worthy of praise. This is when you see someone do something amazing and you can't help but take your two hands and slap them together. Nice job. That was amazing. Why is virtue so important? Two reasons I can think of. One, because it reflects God. The same word for virtue here in verse Five is the same word of God of excellence in verse three. So this virtue is something that's excellence. You are reflecting God himself. Does God like to see his reflection in his image bearers? Do we like to see it in our children? Oh, absolutely. We have such little kids right now, but the times they chose choose to, to, to reflect. It's so awesome. I love to watch it. I was telling one of my daughters, who I feel like I've spent the least amount of individual time with. I want to spend more time with you. And you know what she said to me? What about my sister? I know. It was like, how do I explain to her that we're not leaving her out, but we need to spend, and it was like, I, so I just let it go. I didn't know what to say. <laughs> but I was proud of her for God giving her the heart in that moment to care about somebody else and not just herself. That's a big step, especially for a little kid. That's a whole life thing to figure out, Right? caring for other people. The second reason virtue is so important is because virtue takes you in the opposite direction of corruption where you were. The opposite of virtue, it's corruption. It's evil. It's all those things that people struggle with in the human nature apart from Jesus. All the sensuality, the greed, the covetousness, the violence, the pride, all that stuff. Virtue takes us in the complete opposite direction of it. To virtue, we are also adding, he says here, knowledge. Knowledge of what? Probably knowledge of God's will in Jesus. God has revealed himself ultimately through his son, and we are to grow in that very specific knowledge. Now, two things make me nervous here. One, Christians who don't read their Bibles. How can you grow if you cut yourself off from the source of knowledge of God? How could you grow in the knowledge of anything if you cut yourself off from the very textbooks that teach you how to grow in it? The second group that makes me nervous are Christians who have knowledge, but they've become settled in it. I've learned some. I've been walking with the Lord for years. I'm good. That's it. I'm good. I don't need to learn anymore. No, you are to be diligently putting effort in to grow in the knowledge. Let me ask you a question. Can a gnat swallow the Pacific Ocean? No, can a finite human being grab a hold of all of the knowledge of the eternal and infinite God? No, you will never master. You will never fully grasp the, the, the depth and the height and the width of the glory of God. There's always something to learn and to grow in, in him. There's these videos online where they'll take something like quantum physics and they'll teach it to you at different levels. So what would you tell a kindergartner? What would you tell a fifth grader, how would you tell college, graduate, whatever? I think we should try that. Are you ready? <laughs> we'll take God's eternity. God is eternal. Bible teaches this. First, uh, level one, beginner. What does it mean to say God is eternal? He's always existed. Is that true? Does that exhaust, though, the fullness of his eternity? No, but it's a really good start. God has always existed. Let's go to level three, intermediate. God has always existed, and he lives outside of time. Oh, there's another aspect here to time and God's relationship to it. Let's go advance. Level five. Level five. God has no beginning, no end, no succession of moments in his own being. He sees all of time equally vividly, yet he sees events in time and he acts in time. Do you see that growth? It says not to intimidate you. I'm not trying to impress you. This is to show you there is a great depth to the glory and the attributes of God. 
So what do we do? We read our Bibles. We read our Bible study notes. We read authors who are educated and experienced and gifted to expound the word of God to us. We listen to theology teachings and doctrinal teachings from from those that we trust. We read systematic theologies. The book's intimidating because it's that big, but it's just a bunch of little books all compiled together. Kind of like the Bible. If you take them all apart, like you just have 66 individual books. But you can read systematic theology. It's, it's really not that hard. It just feels intimidating because you maybe have never done it. We, we read expositional commentaries. I was struggling with 1 Samuel in like 2016, 17, 18. I don't remember. And my wife bought me this expositional commentary by Dale Ralph Davis. It was so good. I recommend it to all of you. He went through all of 1 Samuel chapter by chapter and taught it as if you were sitting in a sermon. And I got it and, and I learned and it was so great. And I was exposed to authors I hadn't known before. And this guy was a professor. I think he was a pastor as well. And it was so good. It's so good for us to grow in these ways. Knowledge of God is a gift. You wouldn't know him unless he told you about himself. And guess what he decided to do? To reveal himself. This is not a book about how to be a better person This is a book about how God saves rotten humanity and makes them into the image of Jesus. That is an amazing God. Can I get a witness? We grow in virtue and in knowledge. Next, we grow in self-control. Should we just skip that one? (laughs) Of course not. Self-control. What is self-control? It is restraining. What are you restraining? All those fun things that go on inside of you. Your thoughts, your feelings your desires, your emotions, that can feel hard because inside you can feel crazy sometimes. If I don't let this out, I'm going to go bananas. The jealousy, the greed, the lust, the sensuality, whatever it is, it can feel so unbelievably strong. Can I get a witness? Maybe I shouldn't ask for one. (laughs) But self-control is possible. So what does that mean? Your insides are not in charge of you. Self-control is possible. Self-control is the drawbridge of your castle. It is the final bridge and it's heavy and it takes a lot of weight to put it down, but it's the final checkpoint before you let out that emotion or that thought or that desire. It needs a checkpoint and your conscience holds that drawbridge and it refuses to drop it unless this is a worthy thing to come out of you. Oh, the things we love to take back. I was thinking about this morning. This is more for you ladies when you're trying on a dress and your friends are there or a wedding dress. And your friends, I'll tell you, that's not the one. And they're going to save you from walking out of the store with it on. Right? It's good to have that checkpoint. Self-control is that checkpoint. Sean, self-control is really hard though. Why, why does it seem so? It seems easy to say that, but it really is difficult. I agree with you. Here's two reasons kind of I thought of. One, because our emotions are so strong. And two, we're usually tempted in the areas of our old man, our old woman, those those past areas we really like. You can't, I won't be tempted with alcohol. It has no appeal to me, but you put something else in front of me for my old nature and it becomes much more difficult to restrain myself. The enemy knows those things. He knows those things. So how do we do this? First, we realize Galatians 5.24. Paul says this, in Christ, those of you who belong to Jesus, you have crucified your sinful nature with his passions and desires. That means that those crazy emotions and desires inside of you, Jesus has rendered them inoperative in your life. He has kicked them out of the driver's seat, tied them up and thrown them in the trunk. That's all they can do is from the trunk. They're not in the back seat. They're not next to you. They're in the trunk you are now able to have some control over them and tell them, no, this is not the way it is going to be. So the first step in self-control is realizing it has no power over you. It's not in charge. You are not in charge. That is not in charge of you anymore. The second thing is to align your will now with God's will. It's not in charge of me. I want what you want. And then you make the decision way before it happens that you're going to say no. If you don't do that, you're going to go, well, I don't know what will happen next time. And you'll come to the line and you'll dangle over. I don't know. Should I? Maybe. We'll, right? But if you've already made the decision, no, I'm not going near that line. I want nothing to do with that. No, thank you. 
And lastly, you execute. You do it. It shows up. Not going to happen. Knowledge. Knowledge of the Lord teaches us these are wrong. Virtue tells us to go this way. Self-control says in your body, before you get your glorified body, before Jesus comes back, it's going to happen. But self-control, you can choose. It's not control. I align myself with God. I already say no. And when it happens, I'm going to exercise the grace that God has given me to say no. Amen? He adds here to self-control, we are supplying our faith with steadfastness. What is steadfastness? This is the ability to stand in the difficulty and not be moved. You are standing like an anchor. You are not quitting. You are not giving in. Why is this an important quality to have? Because as we journey the rest of our life, to go into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, you will be challenged. You may want to quit. You may want to turn around. Paul was shipwrecked. He was beaten. Peter was thrown in jail. Jesus was whipped. Paul and Barnabas, they had a disagreement and they went their separate ways. We have to have the kind of faith that endures testing. What kind of testing? The testing of doubts. If you walk with the Lord long enough, you will have intrusive thoughts or maybe actual thoughts of doubt. Is this really God's word? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Steadfastness says what? Absolutely. I may not understand everything. That's okay. You don't need to understand everything. But we need to believe what God has called us to believe in order to be saved and to honor him. Can you get back to third grade? You must also endure test of an immoral lifestyle. Oh, look at Billy and Susan over here. They're living together and they're not married and he's got a great job. Everything seems to be going really well for them. Why don't you join in? Obviously God's not judging them. It's like, no, I know where they're going and I'm not going to be a part of that. I know exactly where that's going. We must endure the test of false teaching. Oh no, Jesus is not really Lord and Savior. Buddha is. No, he's not. I know the word of God. I know the truth and I will stand in it. We must endure the test of bad things happening. You will, in your life, lose things more than your keys. You'll probably lose, I hate to say it, a loved one at some point. You may lose your health. You may lose your job. And you have to have the faith that says, no, I trust in God even in the hard time, even when I don't understand. God doesn't call you to understand everything. He calls you to believe in what he's told you to believe. Amen? The good news is, is you don't have to conjure this up. I got to make myself strong. I got to be steadfast. I got to talk myself in the mirror and pump myself up and watch a motivational video. No, you come to Christ in the same way you believed on him for salvation. So you believe in him for steadfastness. Lord, I need you. Help me. Lord, I need you. Help me. God is already working and willing in you to do the things he desires. Have you ever been to the airport and you see those moving sidewalks and you get on them? What happens? You move so much faster. <laughs> like, this is great. Why don't we put these everywhere? God is already underneath you as a Christian, moving your life, working. You're simply walking on the ground. He's already moving. And this illustration goes for all of these attributes, all of these moral qualities of Christ. It's not God sitting back here. Well, let's see if they finally love somebody today. No, God is working and willing in his people to do the things he wants to do. Again, God deserves the praise. To steadfastness, he adds godliness. Godliness simply is a reflection of God. God, you add a L-Y, godly, we're being like God. And we look at Exodus, we're gonna turn there. Go to Exodus 34, verse six. As the Lord passes in front of Moses, he reveals his character to him. This section here of his character becomes announced, pronounced, re-announced again and again throughout scripture. This was one of the reasons Jonah struggled because he knew this about God. It says here in verse six, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord The Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, 
keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. That is, God forgives, but he doesn't throw his justice out the window. He makes them both a reality. This serves twofold. One, God's revealing who he is, and we praise him for that. Secondly, it also becomes an example for us in the kind of moral qualities or the godliness and that God calls us to be and to do. God is calling us to reflect himself, just as we would desire our children to reflect us, at least in the good ways. What's the difference between godliness and virtue? Here's my attempted understanding of that. Virtue describes the excellence of character. Godliness tells you the source. Who is the source? God is. So we don't ever want to get into virtue for virtue's sake, kindness for kindness sake. It's virtue and kindness because that's who God is and that's who he desires us to be. We are reflecting our great God and Savior. To godliness, in verse 7, he says, brotherly affection. This is a warm familial love. The kind of love that you see in families when they see each other. Hey, how's it going? It's so good to see you. Mwah, mwah. And there's this warmness. There's this hospitality. There's this, you're, you're welcome here and we're glad you're here. Maybe you've never experienced that as a family. If you haven't, I'm so sorry. But maybe you could think of an example. We are to be that here. We are a spiritual family. And that's my hope is that we would be one hospitable church that those who do know the Lord and those who don't would come and they would feel welcomed in his presence. The last one he gives here is love. Love has to do with giving so someone else can gain for their benefit without expecting in return. You know when you're dating someone and you want to tell them you miss them or you love them, but you're kind of afraid to say it because you don't know if they'll say it back? And so you, you get the courage and you say, I miss you. And then they give you nothing. And then an hour goes by. And then a day goes by. And you're like, I'm never saying that again. Never again. <laughs> Not until you say it. You, I'm waiting for you to say it. That's love with strings attached. You better say it back. You bet. But once you get to the point where you're able to love, say it without expecting, I just want you to know I miss you for your sake. That's it. I want you to be blessed by this even if you don't say it back, even if you don't feel the same, I want you to know that. If you can get there, love is very freeing and it feels very good to be able to do that. It feels good to be able to love and forget you even did it. Oh, I totally forgot. Yeah, no, absolutely. I missed you and I love you and things are so wonderful. We are to be a community that loves. Love is the climax. It's what binds all the virtues together. Paul tells us in Colossians 3, 14, I think, somewhere around there. Jesus says people will know us for our Love. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy that love is the end. It's the goal of all these commands. It's interesting that Peter lays out this list and he puts love at the very end of his list. This is a representative list. There's still mercy and compassion in other ways in which we serve and worship the Lord. Amen? And it's probably not a step like you got to do this one, get it perfect, and then go to this one, get it perfect. No, we do all of these. They're all intertwined and we're working on all of them together. Now that we've looked at this list and reflecting upon it, which one of these really stands out? Today's the day to pray over this, to grow in it. We all need growth in all of these. None of us are perfect. But which one of these you feel like, yes, today, that, that I need to grow in that. Here's what I want to ask you to do. Commit to praying for the next two or three days. That's it. Just pray. Lord, I want to supplement my faith with this quality of Christ. Can you please work that in me? I trust how you want to do it, and I can't do it. I keep trying, and I can't. Would you grow? Would you increase this in my life for your name's sake, for your glory? Here are the reasons why, and I, and I put it into two big reasons. Here are the reasons why this is so important. And in light of the big picture of the book, false teachers, remember all this has to do with protecting God's people from false teachers here. Verse verse eight, Peter says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being what? Ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why are these so important? Because they make you productive. 
They bear the fruit that God wants to see. What kind of fruit does God want? The fruit of his presence, the fruit of his very nature in you. He wants that. Remember, we are partaking of what? The divine nature. Kids, when they go to school and then they have nothing to do after school, what tends to happen? Yeah, they tend to make not so great decisions and get in trouble. But kids who have things such as extracurricular sports, the arts, drama, chess, whatever it is they might do, that helps keep them focused. They become these kind of boundaries or rails for them. As Christians, these become that for us. We're so focused on growing and being, letting go of our past. It is forgiven, not headed that way to try to resurrect the dead man inside of us. No, you're in the trunk. Be quiet. I am focused now on driving with my Lord and becoming like him. And God will bear fruit. He will make us productive. And that's fruit that the world is going to love to smell, see, and taste. Verse nine, for whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. If you don't see these, if these are not growing, it might be a good time to say, I need to go back to the cross and realize something. I've been forgiven of my sins. If you're living a life that is completely unlike Christ and immoral, you may not understand the cross. You may have forgotten the cross. And I encourage you to go back to the cross where Jesus hung and paid for your sins. And we know God accepted that because God raised him from the dead. Verse 10, here's our second big reason. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail, never fall. It's a double negative in the Greek. It sounds like this. You will know not stumble. What does that mean? You will absolutely not stumble. When you are walking and reflecting Christ, your eyes are open. Light is, you don't trip over things. You will not fall away and go into apostasy away from our Lord because you're so focused and growing and being like him. Verse 11, for in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When you walk in these qualities, there will be a gracious, rich welcome and the Lord will be pleased in his servants as they enter into his kingdom. This is not a salvation by works at all. This is book of grace, but it's a salvation that now lives a life of doing the works that God has for us and giving him honor and glory in it. Amen. Amen. The word diligent might scare some of you. And I, and I can't imagine trying to touch every different mindset or personality in here, but I don't want it to scare you. I want it to be encouraging. Put my effort here knowing that God's already working. Focus here. God is already moving. Today, we've been blessed to see in the first 11 verses that we are to supply our faith with the moral virtues of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it will make you productive and it will protect you. So what do we do? We're diligent. We are diligent to add these to our faith. Again, I encourage you, pick one of these. In two to three days, pray over it. Lord, work it in me. And if you don't, I will pray for you and we'll make it happen. I'm just playing with you. (laughs) No, I love you guys. And I pray that God would work a mighty work in you this week and the weeks beyond. We are now going to pray. We're going to sing one more awesome song to praise God. And then during the song, I invite you who are believers in Jesus Christ, we are going to take the bread and the cup, symbolizing his bread, symbolizing his body and his blood. And we are going to remember what actually has given us salvation and everything we need for life and godliness. If you are not a believer, please do not come up at this time. This is not a meal for you, but we pray and hope one day it will be. So let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us everything we need. It is nothing, it's not too much for us to come and to proclaim your glory. And thank you for that, for being our good shepherd, our saving shepherd, our resurrected shepherd who continues to care and shepherd his people. Lord, I pray for your people now, you would encourage them. I pray you would calm the fear. I pray you would replace anxiety with peace. You would take doubt and you would give steadfast faith in it. Whatever your people need now, oh, Holy Spirit, would you minister it to them? And would you work in them what is pleasing in your sight? And it's in your name we ask Jesus Christ, amen.